My name is Heather Perry and I am the two-time United States Barista Champion. I am the four-time Western Regional Barista Champion and I took second place in the World Barista Championships in Tokyo in 2007. So today I'm going to kind of walk you through how I run a shot of espresso, what I'm looking for in a shot of espresso, and what for me really makes a great shot of espresso. Um, it definitely starts with great coffee and fresh coffee for sure. You know, as far as what defines great coffee, that really is, I, I kind of look at it as beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Great coffee is the same way. Do you like something brighter on the palate? Do you like something more caramely, dark chocolate or nutty notes? That really is up to kind of you. Um, I really like blends when it comes to talking about espresso. There's a few great single origins out there, but overall I really find that blends kind of please my palate a little bit more. Um, when describing espresso, I want kind of a symphony of flavors in my mouth. I want to be able to taste some high notes and some low notes, and I want to kind of have that overwhelming experience. So I really do kind of lean more towards blends. Today I'm going to go ahead and pull a shot of our WBC, which is the espresso that was awarded Best Espresso in the World at the World Barista Championships in Tokyo. Um, and it's a 3B blend. It consists of a Sumatra, an Ethiopian, and a Brazil. You know, Brazils work great as a base for an espresso because they have some great kind of milk chocolatey notes with just a great little hint of citrus that you can really build upon. Um, and so I tend to really enjoy Brazils in espresso. Now to complement that, I've also got that Ethiopian. The Ethiopian that I'm using is a natural process and it gives me a lot more of uh, that great kind of fruity berry note that I find that I, I find that I really tend to like. It's got a very unique kind of flavor to it and it tends to be very polarizing. People kind of either love naturals or hate naturals because it has such that unique flavor to it. I'm in the love it camp and I think uh, particularly in a blend it can really just have that, that great kind of, hmm, what was that? I want more of that flavor to it. Um, and in this particular blend, it kind of rotates between kind of like a chocolate covered raspberry note coming out of it to almost more of like a blueberry syrup flavor as well. Um, and then the final component is a Sumatra. Uh, I think in the coffee industry, you see people kind of pulling away from some of these Indonesian coffees. And I think there's still some really great Indonesians out there um, that have a really unique flavor profile to them as well. Um, the Sumatra I use for a few things. One, it's got a great kind of depth of flavor to it, so it again has that overall complexity that I'm looking for in the blend. It's also got a great spice note to it that I really enjoy. Um, a little bit of vanilla bean, um, a few baking spices to it. It's also a kind of a bell pepper spice on its own, but I don't get that note in the blend at all, which is something that I like about it. Um, it's a very, you know, the Sumatra that we're using is very kind of uh, blend friendly, if you will. And not all coffees are. I think that's one of the things that makes creating blends so difficult is a great coffee on its own does not mean it's going to be great in the blend. You really have to find kind of blend-friendly coffees that not only bring something unique and have a reason for being there, but then also can really play well with the other coffees. So that's the WBC, and that's what I'm going to be pulling for you uh, today. So again, starting with great coffee, that's kind of tip number one for any type of brew method, whether it's espresso or drip coffee at home, make sure you start with a great coffee and know the roast date. I can't stress that enough. Uh, coffee is perishable. You know, I always say that I wish um, I could put this little pallet in my bags and it would kind of blow up after two weeks and tell you, your coffee's no good. I, coffee molding would be the best thing ever for coffee drinkers because it would force you to drink your coffee fresh. Right now, people treat coffee as though it's enough you can just sit in your cupboard for months on end. And that's not what it is at all. And just as a side note, nuts cannot sit in your cupboard for months either. That's another kind of misconception. Rotate your nuts, they have oils as well, they go bad. Um, so that being said, you know, buy fresh coffee, buy coffee with a roast date, and only buy enough coffee to last you a week or two. We sell our coffee in 12 ounce bags, um, and a big reason is because that's kind of what we find the average home can use within a two week period, which is really the ideal marker for your coffee. Um, but remember, you know, the life of coffee is just about two to three weeks on max. So if you're buying coffee that's two weeks old, you need to use that coffee right away. So if you know it takes you about two, two and a half weeks to go through a bag of coffee, make sure you're buying coffee that's roasted within a five day period. Um, and if you ask somebody, when was this coffee roasted? And they can't give you an answer, you don't want that coffee. Um, many coffees are labeled with expiration dates, which are another thing to avoid. An expiration date can be anywhere from on average 12 to 18 months from the roast date. So stay away from expiration dates. Um, look for roast dates. Don't buy coffee in a supermarket. Buy it somewhere local. Buy it somewhere fresh. Um, so once you've got this great coffee that's freshly roasted for you, you want to make sure you are grinding it fresh. Um, there's a lot of great home grinders out there and they really do vary in price range. 
Um, I kind of tell people, what's your overall budget that you're looking for uh, to brew coffee at home and designate at least half of that money towards your grinder. Your grinder is kind of that basic piece of equipment that you have to have, that you have to take care of and it really changes the overall experience. As far as what kind of grinder you need, I really tell people to start with, what are you gonna be using it for? Um, you know, if you are just going to be kind of brewing um, drip coffee every day, you know, drip coffee of any sort, whether it's on a Chemex or a bee dripper, or even just like a Krups machine at home, you know, if that's what you're doing on a basic every day, a flat uh, burr grinder will work great for you. Those start at $50 and there's great models out there. You know, if you're saying one day I want to do espresso, the next day I want to do French press, the next day I want to do Chemex, you need to invest a little bit more into your grinder. Um, there's some great conical burr grinders out there that vary in price, you know, from $100 to $200. And then there's also some grinders out there that can also help you with dosing or weighing out how much coffee you need. Um, and those go, you know, to the $400 range. But your grinder is cannot be overlooked. Do not buy a blade grinder. We refer to those as being used for spices quite often, and that's where they should stay. So don't use a blade grinder for your coffee at all. Definitely a burr grinder, and again, it's not that big of an investment. 50 bucks can you a great burr grinder at home. I um, mean, you want that for a few reasons. One, um, you want a consistent grind size. What you don't want to see when you're done grinding is powder next to rocks. That's going to cause a very uneven extraction. And an uneven extraction will give you a bad tasting cup of coffee. No matter what that coffee is, whether it's espresso or a cup, it's not going to come out well. So um, that's one of the big reasons that you want to make sure you have that for a grinder. Also, those blades heat up your coffee as they're spinning. They kind of heat up and they release heat that gets onto your coffee. Your coffee then releases its oils and begins to age a lot faster. Um, you're kind of cooking the coffee as you're grinding it almost. So that's the other reason that you want to invest in a burr grinder is you want something that just kind of crushes the coffee, treats it gently, gives you a nice even particle size, allowing for even extraction. So today, as I said, we're brewing an espresso. So I'm using a commercial machine here as well, but a lot of the tips that I'm going to give you work for any type of brewing method. So I've got my, we call this our porta filter, I have my porta filter here, and I'm going to make sure to wipe it off, keep it nice and clean and dry um, right before inserting new coffee into it. That's basic. If you're making a cup of coffee at home, rinse out whatever holds your paper filter if you're using a paper filter. Make sure you rinse that out every day. You don't want those old coffees sitting on there and brewing onto each other every day. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and flush my group head again. I have a screen up here. Um, so again, it's the, the lesson here is keep your coffee equipment clean. Coffee has oils, they sit on equipment, and they go rancid and taste really terrible. I always tell people a great barista cannot overcome dirty equipment. Dirty equipment will always ruin your coffee. Um, so take care of your coffee equipment at home. Don't use harsh soaps on things. Um, you know, if you're, if you're using hot water immediately and washing things immediately, a lot of times that will take care of it. But if you're using any sort of plastic bring things or anything like that, stay away from kind of any harsh soaps on it. Um, if you want, invest in a good coffee cleaner that's going to break down those oils for you. Um, but it's really those oils that you want to make sure we're eliminating when we brew our coffee. Okay, so now I'm going to grind into my porta filter. The grinder that I'm using today does what we call is it gives me a consistent dose. So anytime I use the word dose, we're referring to how much coffee we're using. Today for the WBC, we're using about a 21 gram dose. Um, we talk a lot about grams in coffee, and I always recommend if you're in love with coffee, you know, go out, pick up a $40 gram scale. Um, they're pretty easy to find these days. There's some cool, sexy looking ones out there, and then there's also just some really efficient ones out there. Um, especially if you're into baking, you should already have a gram scale. So you can make it twofold. You can use it for baking and for coffee. Um, but grams is something we definitely work a lot with. If you're like, this is a lot of work so far, I don't want to have to go out and buy a scale, just use this method. For coffee at home, if for any sort of drip method or anything like that, use two tablespoons of coffee for every six ounces of water. Um, if you're doing espresso at home, I recommend picking up a scale. You know, espresso is one of those things where, unfortunately, you can't just throw it together. The more knowledge you have, the better espresso shot you're going to get. So, you know, if you've invested the time or money to go out and buy an espresso machine, no matter what the value of that machine is, buy some things that are going to help you produce great coffee off of it, a gram scale really being one of them, okay? So, like I said, we're using about a 20, 21 gram dose here today. Um, we have fresh ground coffee, and now we're going to go ahead and use our tamp and tamp our coffee. Now, most machines come with this plastic piece of 
tamp thing as they refer to it as and it's fairly worthless I recommend as soon as you open the box you throw that thing away and you invest in a really good tamp um, my employees love to refer to this as kind of like barista jewelry if you will um, there's lots of different colors lots of different sizes here's just a few of them right here um, they also all have different bottoms to them as well I love to use one that I call a C flat I don't call that that's its name um, and so what it is is it's convex and then it's flat and I find that this really helps to reduce channeling. Now, if you're lost and you're like, I don't know what she's talking about anymore, it's okay, just stick with it. I'll get back to basics as well. But for those of you who are doing espresso at home, channeling is something you wanna be aware of. What channeling is, is water is lazy. It's gonna find the quickest way out of whatever you're putting it in, okay? So what a channel is, is it's kind of like a little air pocket where we didn't kind of evenly distribute our coffee for whatever reason. So instead of going through nice and evenly and giving us an even extraction, our water will all go through this little air hole. And so we'll end up with under extracted coffee on one side where all the water just rushed through and possibly some over extracted on another side. So investing in a good tamp, one, it'll make you feel even better about what you're doing. You'll love to hold your tamp. It has a good feel to it. So there's lots of good reasons to invest in a good tamp. Um, now, I actually do not like to distribute my grounds once they're in here. If I was working on a doser grinder, a grinder where it didn't automatically give me the correct amount, but I had to kind of eyeball it or weigh it each time, I may actually do a little distribution where instead of just kind of leaving my coffee in a pile in the center, I move it around, possibly level it out. Um, the hardest thing about espresso is you have to be consistent with whatever you do. Changing your technique from one time to the other will change the results. So it's gonna be hard for you to know, what do I really like best? Because you've changed too many of the parameters. You know, when you're dealing with espresso, change one parameter at a time. But I always tell people, find a consistent method for yourself and stick with it. Then you can do other things like change your dose, change your tamp, certain things to affect the flavor of the coffee, but not the technique. Your technique should be something that is the same every time that you're not having to think about. So what you can really be focusing on is how does that espresso look? How does it taste? Those type of methods. Okay, so I'm gonna dump this one. We've had it out in the air for a few minutes. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grind new again. And that may seem ridiculous. You may be thinking it was only out for a minute or two, but you know, think of when you cut into a banana, how quickly a banana begins to oxidize. Now think of how big that slice of banana is compared to these tiny granules of espresso that we have over here. They oxidize quickly. Get rid of them. Grind it fresh. You kind of want to go as much as you can directly from grinder to your horticulture. Drip coffee is the same way as well. Okay. All right, so I've got a nice level tamp. I have, so, and that tamp is kind of that action of pressing down on the coffee. You want about 30 to 50 pounds of pressure. Um, if you have a scale that you hop on at home, you can throw it on your counter and press down. That'll give you an idea of how much pressure you're using. So I've got all my clean equipment. I just want to go ahead and preheat my shot glasses here. Um, you know, whether you're pouring yourself a cup of coffee or an espresso, always go into some sort of preheated vessel, not an ice cold one, because that'll suck all the heat out of your coffee. And it can shock it as well, giving it kind of a bitter flavor. So something else to be aware of, always go into a preheated vessel. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and run our shot of espresso. So you're gonna see on my machine, it takes about six or seven seconds for the espresso to come out. And that's totally normal. This one took five seconds for this machine. That's totally normal. Yours might come out in two seconds. That might be normal for your equipment, and that's fine. One is not better than the other. They're just different. Different pieces of equipment react differently with the coffee. So the key there is know your equipment. Okay, so I'm going to stop this one. It's about 22 seconds. You can see we've got lots of gorgeous crema in our cup. Um, we're just about one ounce in volume here. And if you look at the top, we've got kind of a nice golden crema on top, a little bit lighter on one end. That's okay though. So I'm going to go ahead and give this guy a taste. When I taste espresso, I always like to kind of mix it up before I taste it. Um, and that's just kind of my rule of thumb. Again, taste your coffee differently or taste your coffee consistently because if you taste it differently, that will change the effect um, or the experience that you have. So I always mix it and then give it a taste. So I'm getting lots of kind of a great clean like Meyer lemon right off the top. Second sip. 
that Meyer lemon has become a little bit more like a tangerine, if you will. Um, a little, not quite as sweet as an orange. It's got a little bit more of a tang to it. It's great acidity though. A nice dark chocolatey finish, with that, which I really enjoy. A little bit of vanilla bean in the middle as well. All right, and it finishes. Whew, tart raspberry right at the finish. Really, really nice. Now, I like this shot, but I also think it can be better. Um, I that tart raspberry, I want to round that out a little more. Make it a little bit sweeter if I can. Um, and that Meyer lemon and that orange kind of tangerine acidity that I get, I think I can sweeten that up a little as well. So I'm going to go ahead and run another shot. Now for me, one of the rules of espresso is before I change anything, I run two shots. My machine's been sitting here for a few minutes, my coffee kind of been sitting there. So I always, before I make a change, want to just run another shot. See if it acts the same way or differently. Um, you know, in coffee quite often we can do what we call kind of changing the grind and a lot of chasing the grind, if you will, where you make all these changes like I was talking about and you never quite get dialed in. Um, so with any technique that you're using, I always say try it a few times. Make sure that you get the same result every time. And if you don't, what could be going on? That's something else to consider as well. legs when it comes to espresso. So my legs are about the thickness of angel hair and you're going to see them get a little bit thicker almost towards that spaghetti. Um, you can see the viscosity, it looks very thick like a syrup or like a honey as it pours out which I like. The color started a nice rusty red and you can see it's starting to blonde up now. And I think I'm going to stop this one right around here. Alright so this shot definitely ran a little differently. You can see we've still got lots of that great crema going on, but our time changed. Our last shot was 23 seconds, this shot was 30. This is more what I thought I was dialed in for. So the last shot was just kind of a fluke. You can see up top, I get a little bit more of a kind of a dark rusty than I did last time, and I like this coloration a little bit better as well. So I'm gonna mix it up. So right off the bat, I noticed kind of a deeper, more intense flavor. It's not quite, the last shot was a little bit one-dimensional as I talked about. And a lot of those kind of bright notes that I mentioned, this one right off the bat, I get more complexity right off of the beginning. Um, I get, I still have a little bit of that mild lemon, but tons of spice right now, which I really like. Let's go for the second sip. Mm. So I get, uh, again, some of that great kind of tangerine, more dark chocolate in this uh, sip as well, and more of, again, that spice. I really enjoy spice, and I like complexity like I was talking about. And the finish, I'm a huge fan of this finish. This is exactly what I was looking for. Kind of that sweet berry. That tart raspberry has really developed in kind of like a soft, sweet berry. Um, like, like that dark chocolate covered raspberry that I had mentioned earlier. It's exactly what I have here. And I love that. I love kind of the journey that an espresso will take you on from beginning to end. I like to drink my espresso typically in three sips. I think it's kind of the perfect way to experience it. Espresso can be very layered, even if you do mix it up. So I enjoy kind of having it on a journey, going through those three sips like I do here. Um, and even for coffee at home, you know, experiment with stirring it versus not stirring it and see if it changes the way you taste it. Um, the other reason I like to kind of stir it is to take some of the heat away from it. You can always taste better when things are almost the same temperature as your tongue. So um, letting things cool off a little bit uh, will tell you a lot about a coffee. Particularly when it comes to drip coffee, a great coffee will still be good cold. A bad coffee will be kind of flat, bland, you won't really notice anything offensive about it hot, but as soon as it's cold, it becomes undrinkable. So that's a really easy sign too. If you're kind of new to coffee and you're wondering, what am I looking for here? Is this good or is it bad? Drink it when it's cold. How does it change? Did it become more flavorful? Did the flavors hold? Or has it become kind of this undrinkable spill that you're kind of just like, ugh, I don't want it anymore. I also tell people, pay attention to your tongue. Sometimes your tongue will tell you, get it off me now, I need water. Probably not something you want to have again. Other times, it may be intense, but your tongue's gonna be like, hmm, I get a lot off of that, that's really nice. The other thing I like to mention is if you're new to espresso, espresso drinkers, when they're kind of first trying to enjoy it, if you will, they drink it and the first response that they get from them is, it's so strong. 
strong. You have to remember though, it's supposed to be strong. Imagine it is vodka or tequila. If you went to the bar and got a martini and it was watered down, you would be pissed. You should treat your espresso the same way. Your espresso should be intense and it should be strong and it should be flavorful. It should not necessarily just be this easy drinking cup of coffee. It should have more intensity to it. So that's the last thing that I'd like to mention. Again, have good, drink good coffee, follow these basic simple tips for any type of brewing method that you are using and you should always end up with great coffee. Enjoy. When you go to buy your tamp, you're gonna wanna take a few things into consideration. First, the most basic thing that you need to know is what is the size of your portafilter, okay? So we said this is your portafilter, so it has a certain diameter to it. This is a 57 millimeter portafilter, so I need to get a 57 millimeter tamp. Home machines range from 52 millimeters up to 58 millimeters on average. So you wanna know the size of your portafilter so that you can make sure you get the right tamp, the proper size. Um, one that is too small will leave you with a really large rim of untamped coffee around the edges and you'll get lots of that channeling that we talked about. So you definitely don't want to get one that's too small. One that's too large, you won't, it won't allow you the ability to actually tamp your coffee because you won't be able to get it in. So know the size of your portafilter. It should be an easy thing to find in your manual. And also, if you don't know, just Google it. Worst comes to worst, Google has everything. So that's the first thing that you want to know. The second thing that you want to know is, do you like a heavy or do you like a light tamp? All of these tamps have different weights to them. Um, some of them are aluminum, the handles, some are stainless steel. Um, this particular tamp has a copper base to it. So this is the heaviest tamp that I have. If you're new to coffee, I recommend getting a heavy tamp. I think that light tamps allow for a lot of uneven tamping. So if you're a beginner, I recommend getting a heavy tamp. Um, but if you've been doing this for a few years, I really like light tamps as well. They allow you to kind of move very quickly, I think. Um, so there's benefits to both. So the weight of the tamp is the next thing you want to consider. Next thing is the handle. If you look at these two handles, um, there's just a small difference between them in that this one has kind of a wider base up top, while this one's a little more slender. Um, they also have some different heights as well. So kind of pay attention to what handle you think would fit your hand best. Now unfortunately, most coffee houses do not have this enormous tamp collection where you can go in and try out all these different size tamps. So what I recommend is you just start buying tamps. Buy one every six months. What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? Um, one of the other things is for a lot, there's a few basic big tamp manufacturers out there. And so most of them, what you can do is simply unscrew the handle. So what it gives you the ability to do is keep kind of the same base that you need, but try out different handles if you want. Or if you love this handle, you can try out different bases. Now, why would you want different bases? We talked about you have to buy the one that fits your machine. Well, even within that, there's a few basic differences. Here's three examples of three different bases. So this is kind of your standard flat tamp. Now, I kind of tell people flamp tamps for braces are like golf clubs for professionals. Does every professional have their favorite? Absolutely. Does it mean that they can't shoot with another set? No, nope, they probably would do fine. Tamps are kind of the same way. I would say most braces have their favorite tamps that they love and that they swear by, but could they pull great espresso with another one? Yeah, probably. So my personal favorite is the C-flat. Again, the difference being it goes convex and then flat. This is your standard one and it is just flat all the way across. This one right here is what we call a C-ripple. So it goes convex and then it all has all these ripples in it. What these ripples do is they kind of create an uneven bed which allows for some pre-infusion which kind of give you a softer and sweeter shot of espresso. Now do I guarantee that this is going to work? No, I mean you have to kind of experiment for yourself and see what works. There's definitely some coffee professionals out there that swear by this and think it absolutely makes a difference and there's other ones that have experimented and say it's nice, but I don't notice a huge difference in my coffee. And yet there's others that say it ruined my coffee. So I don't think that there's one philosophy when it comes to tamps that you can say for sure, I'm always going to get this result with this sort of tamp. No, it really depends kind of on you. So I recommend picking up some different tamps, some different bases, mixing and matching and see what really works for you.